So on behalf of our families, welcome to John's Celebration of Life. It means a lot to us that you come here today. Please join us after the service for the reception. All the songs you hear today were chosen by Jade because she knows her dad loved them. Also, I need to remind you that all of Emory is a no smoking campus. That being said, we have the house till 8, and John's wishes were that we had a party-like atmosphere. He said he didn't want a somber event. John said we should all come together and be happy. I know Heather warned him that would be a really tall order. Everyone here knows that there are going to be tears of grief and happiness tonight. Today's service is going to be a eulogy by many voices. It reflects the complexity and richness of John's life and that of the people who loved him. We'll begin with the eulogy focusing on John's early years, given by his siblings, Jay and Nita. Then John's work life will be captured by Pat, Jermaine, and Amy. Leslie will share about Heather and John's relationship, followed by Hans, who will speak of John's love of the outdoors. Beverly is going to take a moment to speak about family, and my husband Nick will cover Rootfest. <laughs> <laughs> we'll end with letters to John from Jade and Heather. So let's get started. Texas to hunt our granddad and our uncles. 
John and his friend, my now brother-in-law, Paul Owens, had gone down to the bottom pasture to shoot. Well, they shot a deer. Only it was a duck. <laughs> and it was not duck. <laughs> so my mother had to get a neighbor to come help the boys get the deer from the pasture to the barn, and then the neighbor had to skin it. My friend and I had the pleasure of taking the deer down from the hook in the barn, putting it in the back of my mom's sedan, and taking it to the local butcher. As a 16-year-old girl, this was not fun for me, as fun as it was for John. Three years later, John, Jay, and I lost our father to cancer. John was only 13 years old. We went from a family of five to only John and my mother living in Alabama. Jay was in the Air Force, I was away at college, and John was home. These were some tough times for John. It was, a hard, it was hard being a young boy of 13 and the man of the house. When John was about 18, he went to live in Pleasanton, Texas one summer with our uncle and worked on his ranch. John worked side by side with other ranch hands on my uncle's farm who were Hispanic. Because of John's coloring, they thought he too was Hispanic. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't speak Spanish. <laughs> he left Texas with an even darker, darker complexion and a working vocabulary in Spanish. <laughs> he then moved to Georgia and in with Mark and I, my husband, in Roswell. John lived with us just shy of a year and then moved out on his own with Mark's two brothers, Paul and Andy Owens, and then began his career in the restaurant business. Heather is right. He was a man who touched many lives, and in this room are many people whose lives he touched. To Jay and I, he was just our brother who we loved, and we are so blessed to see how many of you loved him right back. Thank you.
Heather and Jade and what y'all brought to his life, we're able to kind of soften out those rough edges. He learned to really see people for who they were, see their faults and let them know in a nice way how to fix them. <laughs> and really let them know how to, how to grow their strengths and come into, uh, into their own as people. Um, I knew John almost 20 years, and every morning I'd get a text of about 8 o'clock every day for, since we've got iPhones or whatever, it's a morning, and I call and say, hey man, what's shaking? And he'd go, me. <laughs> every morning, 20 years. <laughs> That's the John I know. Um, I had a real hard time putting this thing on because I am a born and bred Auburn fan, born and an eagle. <laughs> the only time I've ever said roll tide roll was to John Wayne. One of the strangest phone calls I ever had from John uh, happened about nine years ago. John called and says, hey man, what's going on? And, you know, similar, you know, same old John talk. And he says, I need to ask you a favor, which didn't happen too often. But he said, I need you to become a reverend. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm getting married to heaven, and I would like you to marry me. Absolutely. You know, like anybody else can do almost anything they took the job. So, in 15 minutes and 50 bucks, I became an ordained pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, proceeded to marry John and Heather. I'm pretty sure it was legal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any problems, I'll sign anything. <laughs> but, uh, it took me a long time to sort of come upon what I was going to say about John today. Uh, I've sort of been thinking about it in my mind for a while. Um, I could probably stand here for about six hours and tell lots of really ugly stories about John, lots of really great stories about John. I think he and I saw each other and are probably at our best and our worst. Um, everybody being here is pretty much what John was. Thank you.
But I've seen this guy, you know, go out on the ledge for a lot of people, and he didn't have to. And I've seen him mentor many people, and he didn't have to. He could have been about John, and I mean, if it wasn't for people like me, you know, he could probably be the president of Chili's right now. <laughs> <laughs> to work closely with John, you would know just how amazing he was. He knew no stranger, and he could make light of any situation and bring laughter to the whole office with his crazy antics and outgoing personality. It's not often that there's complete silence in our office, but when it did happen, John would see to it that he would break that silence. <laughs> he would either bust out some crazy song and dance, or the other hand, as women often do, we would start bickering. John didn't like that either. <laughs> so he would start singing, Shifting the atmosphere. <laughs> we couldn't help but laugh at that point and we could have to <laughs> Many of us have been called sunshine by John. And to John, that's exactly what we were. We were a ray of sunshine in his eyes. And I can't speak for anybody else, but when someone calls me sunshine from now on, I'm going to smile my biggest smile and thank the family. There were no secrets with John. <laughs> and you always knew right where you stood. With that being said, he didn't hold back any punches, but he also did not hold a grudge. Once he said it, he was over it. And he would start on a new conversation about one of his many patterns, either about his family, hunting, or Alabama football. <laughs> Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. 
As long as you stood for what was right. As long as you stood for what was right, what was right, and did your job the way it was expected, everything was fine, and John would have your back in any situation. He proved that time and time again. He was definitely a true believer in second chances, and everything that he did at Fresh Point, he gave it everything he had. He wore many hats. He was the shipping manager at one time, the maintenance supervisor at one time. I can't even tell you all the different, how the repack manager. I mean, like, was like, really, John? You're one person, like, he would be there before I got there, and he would leave after I left, and I was like, well, am I doing tonight? <laughs> but, um, anyways, he will be forever missed and never forgotten, and he made sure to that. This next part, when Heather asked me if I would speak today, these crazy things just kept coming in my head, and I was like, no, can't say that. That's too cliche. I can't use that. But I figured out a way to work it in here. There's a phrase people often use, and it goes like this. Live, laugh, love. John did all that. But I think if John could rewrite that today, he would rewrite it as Jesus, love, laugh, and live. Because without Jesus in your heart, you can't truly love yourself or one another. And without love, there will be no laughter. And if you aren't putting Jesus first so you can love and laugh, then friends, you're not living like John lived. I'm going to leave you all with a scripture that was put on my heart the day that I was asked to speak. I don't think that it's just a coincidence that it comes from the book of John. <laughs> John 14, 1 through 4, in the New King James Version, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. But where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. We will forever love and miss John. And thank you so much, Heather, Dave, Jay, Nina, for letting me have the opportunity to speak on behalf of First Point Atlanta. Thank you. Sean to 
say the same thing, that there was just something about the other that they were drawn to. Well, you all know the rest of that story. On a lovely day in June, Heather and John were married in Gulf Shore, Alabama. Alabama. I'll never forget their wedding day, the look on John's face and the tears in his eyes when he saw Heather walking toward him as the song Green Eyes by Coldplay played in the background. Their ceremony was one that embodied their true love and admiration for each other. And the celebration afterwards was one that showcased one of Heather and John's true loves was to entertain people and to be sure that everyone around them was happy and having a good time. This is something that John was always to ensure. If you were around him, you were going to have fun. His spirit and love for life was contagious. As I'm sure you all know, relationships are hard, and no one ever knows the in and outs of other people's relationships, which is typically true. That is, unless you've lived with the couple. I had the pleasure of living with Heather and John for about six months. During the time, I was able to see the amount of true love and respect they had for each other and how they perfectly complimented one another. John knew Heather from the inside out. He knew what made her tick, and he knew what kept her grounded. He was supportive in every way, and was truly her rock. I'm sorry, I don't know why I just looked at you either. <laughs> Let me look at Neil Wheeler. <laughs> has been a hard one, I'm sure, for all of us. I hope that you spent some time remembering John and all the great things he had to offer. <coughs> offer. As I was with Heather this week, I realized, I mean, well, remember, what a smart man John Whitman was and how very much he knew his wife. If you know and love Heather, you know that she has a ton of energy <laughs> and is always busy. Seriously, if you've been at Heather and John's house and you've seen the big old leather captain's chair, she doesn't sit in that. She can't sit in that. Sit in that, she's got a lovely Snuggie. No, nope, that's not Heather. She cannot relax in the captain's chair with a Snuggie. She will actually clean around you while you're trying to watch an Alabama football game. John, of course, he knew this all too well. He knew just what he was doing when he told Heather that he didn't want a funeral when he passed, that he wanted a party. He knew damn well that Heather would throw an amazing party because that's what the women's did. He knew that this would give himself, his wife, something to do to occupy her time. He knew that she would throw her bar and soul. <laughs> She would throw her heart and soul into planning a party that would truly honor John's memory. That's the John we all know and love. Someone who was always thinking of others, wanting to help in any way that he could. Each person that is here tonight, to the celebrations of, celebration of John's life, each of you has felt that just something about this man and something that will keep us all connected to that magic by standing next to and supporting Heather and Jade and keeping John in our hearts. So like many people, I came into John's life through the enormous circle of Barnum. <laughs> and as my friendship with John grew, so did Heather's fear. Fear that I was going to rekindle that inner redneck that she was trying so hard to keep stomped out. And then pretty soon, he'd be going to gun shows with me, there'd be a new bass boat in the pond next to his troll, that there would be dead animals hanging on all the walls. Fortunately, only one out of three came true. John was just a good old country boy from L.A., and that's Lower Alabama. <laughs> and while Heather was busy with her parades, Jade was busy with her books and the band, John had the woods. And you've heard about the success he's had in all aspects of his life, and the woods were no different. Whether it was out fishing me every single time, whether it was going out and getting that trophy buck, 
on the first day of the opening hunting in his new hunt club. Well, don't feel too bad if anyone's here from the hunt club. First time I took him to Athens hunting with me, off of one of our stands, he shot an eight point buck that we had been watching, but it's okay. Or his trips to Arkansas every year, where he could go duck hunting in the morning, go deer hunting in the afternoon. His pull, his power, his influence was so great that he's even got me cheering for Alabama. No dogs. <laughs> but there's really three lessons from John's life that I wanted to share with you today. The first is 90% of success is preparation. John put so much time and effort into everything he did so that that one moment would be the best possible moment for him. The days he spent smoking ribs for rib fest that Nick's going to talk about. The time we spent in the woods scouting and arguing over which tree was the best one to put a stand on. And with that, with those moments, you uh, just don't wait. So the second lesson is don't wait. Live every moment to its fullest. John, even when he's sitting in his recliner watching football, every moment, every conversation, he was taking in and savoring. And the last lesson, and probably the most important, so no matter how dark your path gets, no matter how sad our journey is, pork is your friend. <laughs> Sorry, I had to follow that. <laughs> uh, my voice is not going to carry like that, but. <laughs> so, uh, John Whitman taught me everything. Seven years ago when Heather started working at Oakhurst. I can't believe it's been only seven years. I feel like the Whitmans have been a part of my life forever. Walking into John and Heather's house is like walking into home. 
John and Heather took me in. They loved me. Fed me most nights. <laughs> Otherwise, I knew I was at home eating cereal. <laughs> uh, Captain Crunch, though, was the best. <laughs> and they showed me what family was all about. I will treasure the many memories that I've been allowed to create with John and his amazing family. I'll treasure the ridiculous ones from Ribfest, the serious ones sitting on the couch talking about our childhood and our days growing up, and the unexpectedly emotional ones involving Oprah or <laughs> the voice. <laughs> Of 
that second year, we knew that uh, we were onto something with shirts and we knew we couldn't go back. So ideas, of course, poured in for next year's design. John riding a wild pig, swinging a cowboy hat over his head was one of them. John dancing ballroom style with a pig. <laughs> Sketches were shown to him and he jokingly say something like, uh, why you gotta make my earlobes look so big? <laughs> why you gotta make me look so fat? <laughs> We'd of course wait for John's blessing. Rhyming catchphrases became a part of the t-shirt design as well. Redfest 8, don't be late. Redfest 9, dine on swine. <laughs> The printing of the t-shirts took on a night before Christmas program, where friends and family would come over to our house, eat, drink, and get a sneak peek at the year's design. Hard to believe, but we'd print up to 75 shirts some years, hanging them to dry in our tiny house from every conceivable corner. It was a team effort, everyone had a job, and the spirit of those few hours was magical, hysterical, and memorable. John would come over to me and tell me to change the music that we were listening to in my own house. <laughs> to in his words, some good music. <laughs> Ripfest is a holiday. John would take no fewer than two vacation days from work in order to prepare the ribs and get the sauce just right. Over the years, he upgraded from one small grill to a grill and a smoker, to a huge grill and yet another smoker ever the man to improve his craft. Eventually he'd come over the day of the event and there'd be John drenched in sweat, tongs in each hand hovering over two incredibly hot outdoor ovens like the commander of some delicious spaceship. <laughs> Once everything was to his liking, he'd rightly so go back into the freezing cold house, change his shirt, make a plate of food, and enjoy the fruits of his labor. A shot or two of chilled tequila later and you found him to be a content man. The teachers that John was friends with would inevitably show up early, help set up the tables and dishes, make sure everything looked fun and festive. The restaurant workers would inevitably show up around midnight, <laughs> catch up fast with drinks and food, and then close the party down by crashing on the couch or outside on a chair. <laughs> Neighbors would wobble home. John was ever present. The party would continue the next day, albeit at a much slower pace. <coughs> Leftovers were repeated and the stories of the night before were recounted for hours. John would be congratulated and thanked for a job well done. Ripfest is a holiday, and like all holidays, when you get down to the core meaning of it, you realize that it's about friends, family, and the joy of being a part of each other's lives. And, of course, food. <laughs> John had a gift of uh, bringing people of all walks together to celebrate. And we wanted to be around him. <coughs> Ripfest is a holiday, and the good holidays continue on, <coughs> even when the founders of the holiday leave us. We are fortunate enough to have witnessed the beginning of a beautiful tradition created by an amazing man. So, next summer, let's all gather again and raise a barbecue rib in John's honor. Thanks.
my hero and my role model. You're my best friend and my favorite person in the whole world. You're my dad. I will never forget all the wisdom you give. I'm not sweating the little things that ruin with the punches. Your voice 
always comforted me. Your greatest accomplishment in my mind is Jade. You were so proud of her and took being a dad seriously. You showed me how to be a good parent, to always keep the most important part in my mind, which is how any comment or decision might affect Jade. You loved being a dad, and I had the pleasure of watching your day-to-day -day interactions. Your bond was solid, and you showed her what it meant to live honestly and work hard for the things that were important to you. She is an incredible person and, and will always carry your heart with her. I promise to take good care of her and keep you in my heart when making decisions for her in the future. Your friends and your biological family were one and the same. You loved them all in unique ways. Everywhere we went, we saw someone you knew, or you made a new friend by just being yourself and sharing a smile. You also had a way with our dogs. I'd call them for hours and hours, and they wouldn't listen. You would say it once, and they would come running. They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. This did not apply to you. Our first dog, Maddie, was my furry child from a former life. Maddie was a five-year-old misguided lab mix with boundless energy. You spent hours throwing the tennis ball with her in the backyard and trained her to listen. Even dogs were better because they knew you. <laughs> our road trips with Jade were filled with the sounds of us singing to the top of our lungs to every word to Dixie Chicks, Elton John, and Journey. I promise to continue those road trips with Jade to see your family show her great places, and listen to our favorite songs. You loved your work. You had high expectations, and you always pushed people to be better. But you always did it with love and respect in the last maybe four years. Before that, I guess. <laughs> your last couple of years at Fresh Point were wonderful. You were challenged to learn a new industry and would talk our ears off over dinner recapping the day. I feel like I knew your amazing co-workers before I even had the pleasure to meet a single one. Your mantra is like, a tiger never changes his stripes, or control is an illusion, will always be nuggets of knowledge I will tuck away for the challenging moments. I will treasure your life lessons until my dying day. The last four months were filled with trying times, difficult decisions, and spending time with people we loved. I got to know and love your sister, Nita. Your brother, Jay, was our rock. It provided the love and support that only a big brother could give. The outpouring of food, cards, prayers, and support blew us away. This is all a testament of how wonderful and meaningful your life was to all that knew you until the bitter end your positive demeanor, humor, and strength <coughs> held us up. You were always happiest at the beach, or frankly, any body of water. <laughs> this summer we will travel to Gulf Shores and scatter your asses ashes. <laughs>
heartfelt words. Originally, we planned to use the last part of this to invite people to come up and share the mic and um, have a remembrance of John. But then we realized we had like 300 people coming. <laughs> Everyone wants to come up here and share a story, and we only had the house till eight. So we knew we needed another plan. Our friend Megan pointed out that today is World Alone. We send charity and kindness by personally reading 10 or more people they don't know. So instead today, we ask that you embrace the spirit of John, who is a stranger to no one, to extend a part of yourself to someone you don't know. Take a moment during the reception to share a memory, a story, or a hug with someone who is a stranger to you, but who is a friend of John's. Okay. Now it's time to start that party that John really wanted us. 